Chapter 4 The In Christ Life in Its Fullest If you have soaked in all of the scriptures mentioned in this book so far, you now know how to live spiritually, as if you are already in heaven, even though you are still physically on this earth. Paul tells us that our conversation, lifestyle, is in heaven, Philippians 3 verse 20, because, as far as God is concerned, we can live just like we are in heaven right now, because Christ lives in us. With this understanding, we will now examine the intricate details of the Christ life, and why Christ living in you is so important, the Godhead in Christ. As we previously covered, we are three-part being spirit, soul, and body. The Godhead is also a three-part being. The Spirit is the Holy Ghost, Spirit. God the Father is the soul of the Godhead, since the soul is the essence of who He is. It is the Father, who used wisdom in the beginning to develop the glory plan, the Father of glory Ephesians 1 verse 17. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath He established the heavens. Proverbs 3 verse 19. The Lord possessed me, wisdom, in the beginning of His way, before His works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. Proverbs 8 verses 22 to 23. God the Son represents the flesh part of the Godhead, since Colossians 2 verse 9 says, For in Him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Note that Psalm 104 verse 2 says that God covers Himself with light as with a garment. When Adam was made, Genesis 1 verse 26 has the Godhead saying, Let us make man in our image, which means that man was also covered in light. John 1 verse 9 identifies Jesus as the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, John 1 verse 9. Therefore, when Adam was created, he was literally clothed in the light of God's glory. This is why Adam and Eve were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed, Genesis 2 verse 25. However, after they sinned, their clothing of light was removed. Therefore, they sewed fig leaves together, Genesis 3 verse 7, in an attempt to cover their nakedness. God made man a little lower than the angels, yet he crowned man with glory and honor by giving him dominion over the works of God's hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, Psalm 8 verses 5 to 6. So, God gave Adam dominion over all the earth, Genesis 1 verse 26. However, Adam relinquished dominion to Satan by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil such that we see Satan telling Jesus that all the kingdoms of the world have been delivered unto Satan, Luke 4 verses 5 to 6. Through his death on the cross, Colossians 2 verses 14 to 15, Jesus triumphed over the death of Adam, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 54 to 57, and took back the kingdoms of the world from Satan, such that God says, after the cross, that it is Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever, 1 Peter 4 verse 11. Thus, it is Jesus, whom God ultimately had in mind, when he had the psalmist write about the dominion that God would give man, Hebrews 2 verses 6 to 9. Ultimately, all things will be gathered together in Christ, both which are in heaven, and which are on earth, even in him, Ephesians 1 verse 10. This includes all saved people. This is why Israel says that Christ hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Revelation 1 verse 6. In other words, Israel will be kings and priests unto God in Christ's dominion on earth, just like the body of Christ will occupy positions of authority in heavenly places in Christ's dominion in heaven. See Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 23. The Godhead and man God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4 verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Isaiah 66 verse 1-2. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 When Adam was created, he was made in God's image, but he was not God himself. The reason God created man was so he could dwell within man. 
We see this in the above Isaiah 66 verses 1 to 2 quote, The Lord says that there is no house that man can create that God can dwell in. Instead, God will look for this man whom he will dwell in. This man ends up being the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the reason God gave dominion of the earth over to man, so he could work through man and rule the world from the earth. The complication this plan is that the three members of the Godhead are all holy, Isaiah 6 verse 3, therefore, man must also be holy in order for God to dwell in man, 1 Peter 1 verse 16. Therefore, man must go through a testing period to see if he will choose to allow God to be holy through him. Adam chose to sin, yielding the dominion of the earth over to Satan, and so Adam was not holy. Adam's sin nature is passed on to every person after him, who is born of a man. Thus, Adam's sin has passed to every member of the human race, except for Jesus, because he was born of a virgin, Matthew 1 verses 18 to 23. Therefore, Jesus is known as the second Adam. Then, Jesus had to go through a testing period to see if he would choose for God to work through him. First, he committed to daily Bible studies with the Father so that he would learn the things of God, Isaiah 50 verses 4 to 6. Second, he had to learn obedience by the things which he suffered, Hebrews 5 verse 8. Therefore, he was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil for 40 days, Matthew 4 verses 1 to 2. He learned, from these temptations, not to live by the flesh, 1 John 2 verse 16, but to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4 verse 4. He did nothing of himself. He did only what his father taught him, John 8 verse 28. Thus, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2 verse 8. The reason for this death was so that God could continue with his plan to dwell with man and rule the world through him. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23. Therefore, the justice of God demanded that Adam, and all those born in Adam, die. However, if a perfect man die, the justice of God demands that he be resurrected to new life. When Jesus died on a cross, his death was carefully scrutinized by the Spirit of God. Jesus Christ came by water and by blood, meaning that he offered his perfect flesh, water, and his perfect soul, blood, as a sacrifice for sin, 1 John 5 verse 6. The Spirit of God examined the water and the blood that came from his side, John 19 verses 34 to 35, and the Spirit of God was satisfied with the sacrifice, Isaiah 53 verses 10 to 12. Why? because the Spirit had three witnesses in heaven and in earth to the great worth of that sacrifice. All three members of the Godhead bear record in heaven that Jesus Christ's water and blood were perfect, and the Spirit, the water, and the blood also bear witness in earth that Jesus Christ's water and blood were perfect. Thus, the Spirit of God beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth, 1 John 5 verses 6-8. Having borne witness, the Spirit of God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, Acts 3 verse 15. It was on Resurrection Day that the Lord Jesus Christ was begotten of the Father, Acts 13 verse 33, not before, because his sacrifice had to be perfect in order to pay the sin debt of Adam. In other words, a holy God could not dwell in man until man was holy, and Jesus Christ was not holy until he had done everything that the justice of God required him to do in order to reverse the death that man earned by sin. Therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ spoiled principalities and powers, i.e., Satan and his forces, by triumphing over them in the cross, Colossians 2 verses 14 to 15. In other words, Satan was the rightful owner of all the kingdoms of the world, Luke 4 verses 5 to 7 because man was dead in his trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2 verse 1. Therefore, man could not rule over the world. However, when Jesus Christ died for our sins, Romans 5 verse 8, Satan no longer had a claim to this world's kingdoms. Since Jesus won the victory, God made him both Lord and Christ, Acts 2 verse 36, and gave him a name that is above every name, such that all have to bow down to him, Philippians 2 verses 9 to 11, because he is the only man to live a holy life. Therefore, God gathers all things into Christ, both things in heaven and things in earth, Ephesians 1 verse 10. 
Jesus gives a great summary of God's plan in his prayer to the Father when he says, that they all, believers, may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me, John 17 verses 21 to 23. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost have always been one God, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Mark 12 verse 29. Jesus was born of a virgin, Matthew 1 verses 19 to 25, and he did no sin, 1 Peter 2 verse 22. Therefore, as a man, Jesus was inconstant. Unbroken fellowship with the Father. Then, on the cross, Jesus was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. As a result of being made sin, Jesus, as a man, had his fellowship with the Father broken, such that he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27 verse 46. However, because he never sinned, God would not leave his soul in hell, Psalm 16 verse 10, but he raised him from the dead, Acts 2 verses 31 to 32, showing him the path of life, Psalm 16 verse 11. This means that Jesus was a perfect, glorified man when he rose from the dead. It was at that time that Jesus became the only begotten Son of God, Acts 13 verses 33 to 34. Lucifer wanted to be like the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 14, and was not in the form of God. Therefore, he decided to steal the title away from God by getting Adam to sin, since Adam was the Son of God, Luke 3 verse 38. This is why Satan is called the thief, John 10 verse 10, dot. By contrast, Jesus was born the Son of God in the same sense that Adam was, i.e., he had no sin nature. However, Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God, Philippians 2 verse 6. In other words, Jesus saw God's plan for God to dwell in the perfect man. Therefore, instead of trying to steal God's title away from him, as Satan tried to do, Jesus yielded to his Father's plan so that God could dwell in man. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He then became obedient to the Father unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God exalted him, giving him a name above all names, such that he is Lord over all. Philippians 2 verses 7 to 11. Then, when God raised him from the dead, he became God's only begotten son not just in body, as Adam was, but also in soul and spirit. In other words, in order for God to dwell in man, not only did man have to be born without a sin nature, but he also had to suffer trials and be obedient such that he always trusted in the Father's plan. Then, God would have a man, who is perfect in body, soul, and spirit, such that God could live in him for all eternity. The man who did this is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we recognize that we have sinned and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sin, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4, the Spirit baptizes or identifies us into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. This means that our old man is crucified with him, Romans 6 verse 6. Since we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, Romans 6 verse 5. Thus, God now dwells in us, because God dwells in Christ and Christ dwells in us. The Godhead in the Bible. The final step in the Father's glorification of us is giving us our glorified bodies at the rapture. Now, we have already received the gift of eternal life by believing the gospel, Romans 5, 1, 9, 11. However, because we still have our vile flesh, Philippians 3 verse 21, we still have a choice to either allow Christ to live in us, Galatians 2 verse 20, or to fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Galatians 5 verse 16. The way that Christ lives in us is by his word. We have already seen how the Godhead was in man by Jesus Christ. The way that the Godhead was in him was that he lived by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4 verse 4. The reason for this is that all three members of the Godhead are within the Bible itself. God the Father is called the Father of Glory, Ephesians 1 verse 17. 
That is because he is the one who used wisdom in the beginning to develop the glory plan. The Father possessed wisdom in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. Wisdom was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. Proverbs 8 verses 22 to 23. God the Son is the Word itself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John 1 verses 1 to 3. God the Holy Ghost is the one who made it possible for the Word to be fulfilled, as we see the Holy Ghost descended upon Jesus, Luke 3 verse 22, and He is the one who moved holy men of God to write down the Word in a book called the Bible, 2 Peter 1 verse 21. The Godhead in the Bible in your inner man. In summary, when we believe the Gospel, our lives are placed into Christ, making resurrection life in us possible. We live out our eternal lives on earth to the extent that we allow Christ to sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of water by the word, Ephesians 5 verse 26. The more we live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, the more Christ lives in us and the more God can live through us in eternity. Granted, the Lord Jesus Christ will complete the good work he has begun in his body, Philippians 1 verse 6, so that he can present to himself a glorious church, not having spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, Ephesians 5 verse 27. However, how we serve Christ for all eternity depends upon how much sound doctrine we get built up in our inner man on earth. Remember that we are the body of Christ, and God hath set the members every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 18. In other words, one person may only allow Christ to build up enough sound doctrine in him to be Christ's pinky toenail, while someone else may allow much more sound doctrine to be built up in him, such that he can be one of Christ's fingers. Once enough members of the body of Christ have the sound doctrine built up in their inner man to fill all the functions of the body, then the fullness of the Gentiles will be come in, Romans 11 verse 25, and the rapture will take place. We know Christ will be faithful to complete the building of his body, because he has nothing but time to do so. Therefore, eventually, all positions in Christ's body will be filled, but they are only filled as we allow Christ to sanctify us with his word. Colossians 2 verses 2 to 3 says that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in Christ, because he is the word. We learn the word by the Holy Ghost teaching it to us as we read and believe it, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. Therefore, it is absolutely vital that we read and believe God's word so that Christ can make us into more important members of his body so that his body will be filled with qualified members to run the heavenly places for all eternity. In the end times, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, 2 Timothy 3 verse 13, because Satan knows that his end is near. However, God has Promise to preserve the Holy Scriptures, 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, forever, Psalm 12 verses 6 to 7. Therefore, the man of God can still be truly furnished unto all good works, 1 I Timothy 3 17, by mining the treasures of wisdom and knowledge found in Christ Jesus, by allowing the Holy Ghost to teach him sound doctrine as he reads and believes God's word. God forever dwelling in man. Once the dispensation of the fullness of times begins, Ephesians 1 verse 10, all believers will be in Christ. Then will be the complete fulfillment of Jesus' prayer to the Father in John 17 verses 21 to 23, that they, believers, all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. This is how God will dwell with man for all eternity. Ephesians 2 verses 20 to 22 says that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Therefore, in Isaiah 66 verse 1, when God asks Israel, Where is the house that you build unto me? The answer is that Israel cannot build a house for God. 
Instead, Jesus Christ himself shall build the temple of the Lord, Zechariah 6 verse 12 1, by being the chief cornerstone through his death on the cross by which we become part of his building, and 2, by sanctifying us through God's word so that we may grow unto an holy temple in the Lord, Ephesians 2 verse 21. Because Christ is building this temple and Christ lives in us, we can already experience unity with the Godhead today. Therefore, it is absolutely essential that we read and believe God's word. This is why Proverbs 4 verse 7 says that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, you serve God, not necessarily by the activity you do, but by Christ doing that activity through you, because you have used the mind of Christ through gaining wisdom from God's word to allow Christ to live in you. This is the omnipotence of God working through you today, so that God has a place to dwell for all eternity. How big is God? The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. 2 Chronicles 6 verse 18. This is because God is a spirit. John 4 verse 24. God has spent the last 6,000 years building himself a house. The house God has built is holy man. And the reason we are holy, Colossians 3 verse 12, is because Christ is holy and Christ lives in us. When Christ died, the Spirit of God witnessed his death as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. This Spirit encompasses the Godhead in heaven and the Spirit, soul, and body of man in earth, 1 John 5 verses 6 to 8. When we are saved, we are placed into Christ so that we are one with him. Therefore, for all eternity, Christ will be in believers and God will be in Christ, John 17 verse 23, which makes for God's perfect, eternal home. Testimony 3. From extreme religion and drugs to Christ is my only life. I was raised Catholic, but I gave it up as soon as I could. In 1969, at age 19, there was one major influence in my life. That influence was the hippy-dippy movement of the late 60s that preached make love not war and if it feels good, not God. Do it. My generation was enraptured by the idea of a perfectly constructed, man-made world where all the bad vibes would magically disappear in an ethereal cloud of hash smoke and patchouli oil. Since everyone from Baba Ram Dass to the Beatles proclaimed that we were gods, then gods we would be. Our country was a democracy and God, lower case, was only permitted to be a co-equal voter on our communal cosmic island. We were sincere, but much too spoiled, overprivileged, and dangerously naive. Our churches had not come close to preaching the cross to us. Understanding what it meant to have a living Christ functioning in our soul was as otherworldly as an alien informing us to phone home. My contemporaries and I were desperate to get it right and make it real. We diagnosed the symptoms of our fatuous generation and self-medicated with psychedelic drugs and condemnation of the system. After four years of this lifestyle, I really was looking for something more real and more eternal. I read Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. At about the same time, I went to a James Robison evangelistic crusade in my town of Morgan City, Louisiana. Finally, on December 10, 1973, at age 23, I believed the gospel through a Baptist young man's witness, too. Me. I tried to fit into evangelical churches for about a year and then walked away from that organized religious stuff. Tragically, the truth of Christ in you, your, hope of glory, Colossians 1 verse 27, was not my center. For years later, 1978, I got married and, after about a year of marriage, one of my old friends invited me to a Pentecostal church, which I then began attending regularly. I was taught the prosperity gospel along with a portion of the holiness gospel. In other words, serve God and obey the law and God will bless you. Basically, it was a yuppie type church that tried to commingle the Abrahamic covenant with spirit-filled gifts and then use that power for its own benefit. I followed this. prosperity gospel and tried to use my faith to convince God to give me all the gifts of the Abrahamic Covenant. Beginning in 1980, I became a leader and church builder of three different spirit-filled churches. Then, around 1981, two things happened to me within a three-month period that would change my perspective. One, my wife had a miscarriage. Ironically, this took place in a strange city where she was going to a prosperity conference with me. So much for the prosperity gospel. And two, I lost my business and went bankrupt, 
owing the government over $500,000. These two things convinced me that God wanted me to get to know him in a really eternal and interior way, rather than using him as a slot machine. One night, in 1984, I went to an old friend's church that I helped establish. I went through all of his spirit field magazines until I found a magazine called Union Life, which explained to me two things. One, I cannot lose my salvation, which was completely different from what the Pentecostal church taught me. Two, I learned that Christ actually lived I in me. Galatians 2 verse 20, Christ liveth in me, was used by the Holy Spirit to renew my mind literally overnight. Finally, in 1987, I got totally burned out from trying to please a distant God through my works and left the Pentecostal churches I was a part of. For a few years now, I had been going through a process of pruning and mind renewal. I wish that I had been taught this message as a child. I wonder what my life would have been like if the message of Christ as my only life had been mixed with my mother's milk and my father's voice. My Heavenly Father could not and would not turn back the hands of time. Instead, he gave me a much greater and more satisfying gift. He showed me how to live his life in front of my wife and children. Slowly, painfully, he stripped off layer after layer of carnal thinking, and my kids got to see how a mind could become renewed to someone greater than itself. Over time, the Holy Spirit renewed my mind to the eternal fact that the following three things are of real, eternal value. 1. I cannot live the Christian life or any part of my life. Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing, I seek, the will of the Father which hath sent me, John 5 verse 30. What makes me think I can do any more than that? 2. Christ Jesus is the only life there is. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14 verse 6. Dot. 3. Christ Jesus desires to live his life through the believing Christian. Our job is to allow our minds to become renewed to the fact that we can only become an eternal reality by living in union with Christ who lives within us, Galatians 2 verse 20. Therefore, I have resolved to trust the life of the Son in me and base my identity on the humbling truth that Christ is my only life. As I learn to trust the Father's love, my Heavenly Father can trust me to reflect the wisdom of His counsel. I pray that my life reflects a strong desire for intimate union with my Father. The Christ life message is an astoundingly profound truth. I came to it with 33 years of worldly and religious contamination. I was like some victim of an atomic blast who had become irradiated with the fleshly fallout of a corrupt and dissolute world. I, like all of my generation, was a damaged soul. I desperately needed to become decontaminated by the washing of the water of the Word of God, who is Christ in me. The Holy Spirit began renewing my mind and taking away the absurd identities that I thought served as my shield from pain. The truth is that those false layers of soulish camouflage only desensitized me to the cleansing and resurrecting power of the cross. Until I, the old me, died on it, I, Christ in me, could not truly live. For when I am weak, my flesh, then am I strong, Christ is strong. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10 Appendix, what we have in Christ. The following is a list of 40 things that we have in Christ. None of these things can be accomplished by the flesh, even after we are saved. 1. Our redemption, is in Christ Jesus, Romans 3 verse 24. 2. The law of the spirit of life, is, in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 verse 2. 3. The love of God, is in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 8 verse 39. 4. We are sanctified in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. 5. Christ Jesus is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. 6. When we die, we fall asleep in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 18. 7. Our hope is in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19. 8. We are alive in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22. 9. We rejoice in Christ Jesus our Lord, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31. 10. All the promises of God are in Christ, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. 11. We are established in Christ, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21. 12. We always triumph in Christ, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14. 13. The law is done away with in Christ, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 14. 14. 
We are a new creature in Christ, IL Corinthians 5:17. 15. We are reconciled to God in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19. 16. We receive God's righteousness in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. 17. Things are simple in Christ, IL Corinthians 11, colon 3. 18. We have liberty in Christ Jesus, Galatians 2 verse 4. 19. The promise of eternal life is in Christ, Galatians 3 verse 17. 20. We are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3 verse 26. 21. All believers are one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3 verse 28. This is true ecumenicalism. 22. Obedience of the law is not necessary in Christ Jesus, Galatians 5 verse 6 and 6 15. 23. We have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 3. 24. We are chosen in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 4. 25. All eternal things are in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 10. 26. God's mighty power is in Christ, Ephesians 1 verses 19 to 20. 27. We are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 verse 6. 28. We are created in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 verse 10. 29. We are nigh to God because we are in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 verse 13. 30. God's eternal purpose for the church is in Christ, Ephesians 3 verse 11. 31. Our consolation is in Christ, Philippians 2 verse 1. 32. Our high calling of God is in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3 verse 14. 33. We are rooted and built up in Christ, Colossians 2 verse 7. 34. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Christ, Colossians 2 verse 9. 35. We are complete in Christ, Colossians 2 verse 10. 36. We are glorified in Christ, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 12. 37. Faith and love are in Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 1 verse 14. 38. God's grace is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. 39. Salvation is in Christ Jesus, IL Timothy 2.10. 40. Godliness is in Christ Jesus, which is the summary of all these things, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12.